Now, long before Ferguson, long before Eric Gardner, long before the recent police shootings in South Carolina, our law students here at law school, under the extraordinary leadership of Professor Craig Futterman, have worked to further the objectives of police accountability. The Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project of the Mandel Legal Aid Clinic was created in 2000, created by Professor Butterman under the direction of Professor Randolph Stone, and is noted as the first of its kind in the nation, as well as for achieving a broad variety of wonderful results in cases in Chicago and elsewhere. Now students in the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Clinic, along with their partners in the Invisible Institute, have long recognized the importance of studying and working to improve the interactions and relationships between black youth and the police. Over the last four years, University of Chicago law students have intensely studied how teenagers experience encounters with the police. Their work is a wonderful example of the value of interdisciplinary work, which is part of our DNA as a law school. Law students have worked with teams of journalists, documentary filmmakers, sociologists, anthropologists, and public policy students at the university, and also with lawyers, policy makers, and teachers. Most of all, our students have come to appreciate all that they could learn from listening to young people, that young men and women possess relevant knowledge and also experience that is missing from the current discourse over the relationship between the police and our inner city communities. This conference builds upon all that we have learned from this terrific work. It seeks to bring together you, a larger and more diverse audience than is usual at academic conferences, people from all spheres, not typically in the same conversation. We have here researchers, policy makers, judges, law enforcement, youth, lawyers, <clears throat> teachers, students, organizers, service providers, and our neighbors. And we bring all of you together today to engage in these difficult questions and to guide our policy, our research, and our advocacy. Now, I couldn't imagine, it almost seems obvious to say this, but I can't imagine a more timely event or a more important topic. I'm excited that all of you are here with us today. Now, before we kick off the conference, I would like to thank some of the folks who have provided us with generous support. Thank you to the Cantor family, who supports so much policy-relevant work here at the law school. Thank you to the university's Office of Civic Engagement, as well as the Urban Network. And of course, thank you to all of the presenters today and the participants in our discussion today and tomorrow, and the variety of organizations that are set forth in the program who have also contributed time, energy, and resources to making this conference so important. And now what I'd like to do is turn the podium over to Craig Butterman, our indomitable, terrific, energetic, uh, brilliant Craig Butterman, and wish him two days, wish him and you two days of productive discussion. I look forward to hearing some of it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You're welcome. Um, this Dean shall share. Can y'all hear me back there? This 
Dean shall share this conference promises to be something special. Um, this is a little bit different than, um, I mean, it's, it's different in a lot of ways than some of our typical academic conferences. I look around the room and first I do see, as typical from a lot of our academic conferences, some of the world's greatest minds and world's greatest researchers and academics here present in this room and will be with us over the next couple of days. But I'm also just looking in front of me, I'm seeing young people who we work with, teachers, as Dean Schill said, that's the police officers who are present, um, policy makers, even judges, and our neighbors from the surrounding community. In the same room, at the same time, in the same conversation. We hope our goal is to try to deepen the national conversation about race and police. A conversation that raises some of our country's most fundamental issues. And we want to do that from a view from the ground. A view from some of the young folk who are here who are most affected by police practices. As Dean Schill said, over the last four years, um, we've studied how teenagers experience police. Something that we um, affectionately call the Youth Police Project. And it's the youth slash police. And there's a lot of arguments over the slash and what to do with youth and police. Most of all, not youth versus police. And this was purposefully not an adversarial project with black kids on one side and police on the other. In the last three years, or in the last, I'm sorry, first, in, in the first year of the project, we were working and talking with kids around the south and west sides of Chicago Public High Schools about their experiences. And the last three years, we've been working closely and intensively with high school students here at Hyde Park Academy um, through a media program run by Ms. Kiva McGee. Um, Chicago Public High School, for those of you who don't know Hyde Park, just about three blocks from the law school, three blocks from here. And our conversations with the kids focused um, on their everyday encounters with police, the everyday, the normal, the routine, not the high profile incidents of police abuse. And while just a couple blocks away, high school students from Hyde Park shared with us experiences that felt to my students and felt even to me sometimes like they were experiences that were from a completely different world from our world here on campus a world where there were some different rules, different practices, and sometimes even a different constitution. This conference, as Dean Schill says, builds first and foremost from all that we learn from the kids on the ground, our conversation, and then also, I should say, from conversations that we've had with police officers about how they experience this very same encounters. So I feel blessed today, truly blessed to be among all of you again, people who are not always typically a part of the same conversation, but who really need to be so that we can have a discussion, and a real discussion, about what needs to be done to improve policy, to improve our research, and to improve, improve our advocacy, to improve both the lives of young people, not just young people here, but young people around the country, and also to improve the effectiveness of police in addressing real issues of violence to offer real practical solutions to some of our country's most vexing problems. Again, not youth versus police, youth and police. Okay. As Dean Schill noted, full disclosure, um, he said that I, I direct civil rights clinic here at the law school. And one of the things that my students have done, Dean Schill referred to, we brought cases. And my clinic students have sued police officers. We've even sued entire police departments for patterns of civil rights violations. We know we can get you in trouble. But I want to say that I'm far from a hater, um, and that's what I try to also model with our students, too. I have deep respect and admiration for the job, for the profession, for men and women who do policing right. But I also hate police abuse. And I don't hate it only because it inflicts serious harm, it has inflicted serious harm on ordinary people and their families and entire communities. I know that's reason enough to hate. 
I also hate it because I know the damage that it does to good police, the dishonor it brings to a profession and people who I deeply respect. And this conference is designed with those sentiments in mind. Before I turn things over to Jamie to really kick us off and to start our first panel, um, Jamie Calvin, close friend, conspirator. Um, I can first need to express my heartfelt thanks to first Dean Schill and the law school, um, my colleagues at the Mandalay Legal Aid Clinic, because without the support of the law school and the dean, my colleagues, this conference just wouldn't happen. We wouldn't be here today. I'm also grateful for, as the dean mentioned, for the generous support of the Cantor family, the Office of Civic Engagement, the university, and the Urban Network for their generous support. Um, and I'm also deeply grateful for, and I'm sorry, I know the thanks are boring, but it's, it, it's it, I really, this is important, and I really we should acknowledge the folks who brought us together and who've done the real work behind the scenes. So many of our sponsors, um, organizations that represent kids, law enforcement, and other of our campus partners who you see in the program itself, um, who have contributed in ways more than just money, but in their time, efforts, supporting us, everything that we've asked for, folks have stepped up and done. And we'll appropriately also recognize the youth police team later in this conference. Most importantly, of course, um, we couldn't have done any of this without the partnership of Ms. McGee. Um, special public school teacher who directs the media program at Hyde Park Academy and all the students. This is Elton for y'all. Before I close, distrust between black kids and police that didn't start in Ferguson has been here for years. And it's done way too much damage, way, way, way too much damage, both to black communities and police. Our goal when you come out of this conference, we hope that you walk out with something more than a memory of, man, this is a great conversation. We really learn things from one another. That was cool. But that, I hope that everyone walks out of here with something that we can take back with us, something we can take back to our colleagues, to our departments, to our schools, to our policymakers, to our community, something real, something concrete. This conference, to me, represents an opportunity for more than great conversation and great talk, which I know we'll have, but it presents an opportunity for real change. And with that, I just want to welcome you to Youth Lose Conference. Thanks, Craig. The, um, we call this the Youth Police Conference, but I think what we intend is the Youth Police Conversation. Um, this will not be a conventional academic uh, conference with presentations and you know, a sequence of uh, speakers speaking to the audience, but not with one another. We, um, the essence of the conference is the conversation we'll have together. And the design of the conference is meant to, to facilitate that. So there will be a series of um, moderated panel conversations that will then open up into conversations with, with all of you, anyone who wants to, to engage. The, um, those conversations will be preceded and kind of grounded by short videos that are we produced with our, our young colleagues and collaborators at High Park Academy and Ms. McGee's class. Um, we really want to make sure that the, the conversation as it unfolds remains grounded in, in their reality and the things we've learned from them over these last several years. Also, each of you should have a, a short paper Craig and I wrote uh, called Notes on the Youth Police Project to provide some background on the project and a point of departure for, 
for the, the conversations that will unfold shortly. I have a couple of other, a few other, just purely housekeeping details. Um, uh, remember to keep your cell phones on silent. Um, also, there's no food or beverages in the auditorium. Uh, if you want to follow and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag at um, youth please, um, at you, uh, you, uh, you shy, you shy engagement. You shy engagement will be live tweeting, and you can follow at Jamie Calvin for the Invisible Institute's perspective as well. I should confess to you, I don't know how to tweet, as I've probably illustrated in reading these directions. So I have their little munchkins up in the control room who do the tweeting for the Invisible Institute. Um, also, if you want to be on the uh, Invisible Institute's uh, email list, you can sign up at, at invisibleinstitute.com or at the uh, reception desk, the registration desk. Finally, there is a reception in the classroom hallway outside the auditorium in immediately following the last session today. An extraordinary series of events across the nation have brought us to something akin to a truth and reconciliation moment with respect to patterns of police abuse and impunity in minority communities. Largely ceremonial at the national level, this dynamic, this dynamic is, as we've seen in a number of jurisdictions across the country, complex and volatile at the local level. I think there are lessons that we can learn from other nations around the world, the <laughs> polities, that have been confronted with the challenge of um, reckoning with the nature of their own societies with things that are fundamental to the way life is organized in, in their societies. Um, I'm thinking particularly of settings where there have been what are generally referred to as truth and reconciliation processes when um, nations try to fashion and articulate a transition from eras of, of repression to a more humane and democratic society. There are several particular lessons, I think, that, that can be extracted for our purposes. Two central themes that such efforts almost always share are public acknowledgement and accountability. By public acknowledgement, I mean a kind of reckoning within the society with a set of, a set of harms that have been inflicted on some members of the society some populations within the society. Telling the stories, documenting, you know, fully documenting um, what happened historically and over time, and doing it in a way that translates the, the private knowledge that people carry, often, you know, with respect to, to repressive and violent regimes, harrowing, isolating knowledge, that translates that private knowledge into a, a public acknowledgement. And when that happens um, and is fully realized, it's transformative. It enables the life of the society to go forward. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the challenge of um, addressing the kind of harms that have become so massively visible in the last year in, in our society are similar to that. You know, the press often likes to uh, put the frame of crisis around uh, sort of on major ongoing stories, but it doesn't really it doesn't really fit to uh, describe this amazing kind of phenomenon across the country right now as a crisis. It's not a radical departure from the norm. What we're seeing is the norm. What we're seeing are things about you know, fundamental features of our society that we've managed to live with but not see. What we're seeing are harms that fall on some of our fellow citizens and not others. What we're seeing, as, as Craig alluded to, is the sense in which we have really two constitutions. That the Constitution means one thing where we're standing right now and something quite different a few blocks from where we are right now, uh, and where some of our, our friends and colleagues from High Park Academy live. 
Um, the, second, the second sort of core principle along with, with public acknowledgement and trying to figure out what that means is the priority of accountability. There have, long, there have been lots of ideas and different strategies and policy interventions that have been talked about in the context of the current debate about, about police abuse. What we will be arguing and engaging with you about in the course of this conference is the notion that accountability has priority. If we don't create meaningful mechanisms of accountability so that when police officers exceed their, their powers and abuse citizens, then all sorts of other good ideas, sensible ideas, uh, reasonable policy suggestions will be undermined if not altogether impeached. So public accountability and pu public acknowledgement and accountability. Finally, I think it's also important, and there are splendid examples of this uh, around the world, that statesmanship will be required on all sides if we articulate a path forward that shines a light on long-standing patterns of human rights violations while building and maintaining the relationships that will be required incrementally and over time to effectively address those, those harms. The hope with which we open this conference is that we will together advance the work of publicly acknowledging the harms while building the relationships to address them. And now we'll begin with the, the first panel and start with the first video.